Hello and welcome to worship. We're so glad that you could join us and we pray that this will be a blessing for you. Today our guest preacher is uh, Pastor Wilhelmina Swart. Pastor Wilhelmina is the missional pastor at the South Coast Beach Project in Port Dover, Ontario. A discipleship and leadership experience for young adults. Good morning, Cross Point Community Church. It is great to be here with you on this last Sunday of 2020. I want to invite you to these words of call to worship. We are the church that lives into God's future today. A church united across space and time. A church of many races, languages, and ethnicities. A church that lives by the work of God in Christ that was, is now, and is still to come. The one who is seated on the throne says to us, see, I am making all things new. A new heaven and a new earth where the home of God is among God's people. God's future is epic and it's good news. Remember God's future for this is our story. And hear these words of God's greeting. Grace and peace to you from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. Amen. We just heard that God is our lighthouse, that he is the beacon in the storm. And that's such good news. 
and he is a good God, so we can come to him in a time of confession where he sheds his light on us, not to condemn us, but to transform us. So I invite you into this time of prayer of confession and also to hear the words of assurance. Through the work of Jesus Christ, we belong to him. Through Jesus' work on the cross, God gave us a new name. Let us discover anew and accept with new assurance that we are who God says we are, holy and redeemed people who belong to him. Thank you, our Father, for changing our name. We shall no longer be called wounded, outcast, lonely, afraid. Our new name shall be the holy people, the redeemed of the Lord, sought after, the city no longer deserted. People of God, let us take up our new name with confidence to live this coming year as the people of God we are called to be. May others seek God's face because of us this coming year. Amen. We believe that everything we have comes from God and we take time each week to give some back. We do this by supporting the ministries of Cross Point Community Church. The deacons have also asked us to remember the work of Resonate Global Missions, an agency that brings the gospel of Christ in many countries around the world and in Canada. Let's bring our thanks and concerns to God in prayer. Gracious God, our Father and King, we pre you prepared the way for the coming of your son Jesus and this past week we were able to celebrate his birth. It may have been a bit different this year with no big family gatherings, but thank you for reminding us that even when the circumstances are different and not what we consider normal, that doesn't change the fact that Jesus came as a baby and became our Savior and King. Lord, we look back today on a very unsettling year Many have gotten very sick with coronavirus, and many have died. Lord, when we look at the numbers of COVID cases, let us remember that numbers represent people. We pray for those who are sick, not just with COVID, but all who need your healing. Be with them, Lord, and with those who care for them, doctors, nurses, paramedics, and caregivers. And as we see the number of deaths, let us remember that each one of those numbers is a person who has a family that is now grieving. We pray for those who are grieving and we ask that you give them comfort and peace. We pray for those who have had their lives completely changed by loss of a business or employment. Lord, we're thankful for government that has helped so many through financial crises and all the social services that are available to help. Lord, our provider, help your people who are in need of food, clothing, and a warm place to live. We think about all the things we've had to do differently this past year, and we thank you that we learned how to do it. Thank you for the technology that can keep families together by video and make videos like this one possible. Thank you for the creativity that people have shown in reaching out to others even when they couldn't be together. For drive-by celebrations and porch visits, we enjoyed weddings, anniversaries, birthdays, and new babies. We thank you that life continued even when things seemed upside down. And now, Lord, we look forward to a new year, a year that isn't starting out much different, but we have hope. There are vaccines that we hope will quell the pandemic and let us relax a little. There's the hope that in time we'll be able to be together to worship you in a church on Sunday morning. Lord, we just passed the season of gift giving and now we ask for your gifts that you give through your spirit, that we may live our lives filled with joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, and above all, love. Father, we join with the church around the world in saying that yours is the kingdom and the power and all the glory forever. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning, kids.
If you remember the last time I was with you, I used this book and I'm using it again called Thoughts to Make Your Heart Sing. And it's on different topics related to the Bible. And I chose one today called Hope. And the reason is, I think when we are starting a new year, we're kind of hopeful, maybe even more so this year because of all the weird things that have happened in 2020. So let me read this to you. Hope. When we use the word hope, we say things like, I hope we win. It's like wishing for something we're not sure will happen. But in the Bible, hope means being absolutely certain something will happen. Jonathan Edwards, a preacher, said that there are three things we can hope in if we belong to Jesus. One, God will turn even the bad things around for your good in the end. Two, your good things can't ever be taken away from you. Three, the best things are yet to come. It doesn't mean that everything in our story is happy today, but that God is making the story end happily for the world and for his children. And hear these words from Romans 15 verse 13. The God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope. Let me say a quick prayer. Dear God, I pray that you especially be with the kids, but all, all of us are your children. And we just pray for some new hope. There are lots of things that we hope for. I know recently I hoped for a puppy and we were actually able to get one and I'm so thankful for that. But Lord, thank you that there are things we can hope for that are certain, that you are in control of our stories, that you will bring good things to us and that the end of the story is happily ever after. We pray this all in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We are on the edge of stepping into a new year. And there is a wow factor that comes with things that are new, right? Maybe at Christmas time, even though it's been a more subtle Christmas, you still got stuff. Maybe that new toy or that new gadget. There's also something exciting about a new identity. When young adults leave high school and go into college or university, sometimes they feel like they can remake themselves and there's something new. Or often in the new year, we think about what resolutions do we want to make to make ourselves somewhat new. Well, I think that we are created and that we long for new. I think right now we feel that even more because we're just ready to have 2020 done and definitely have something new to step into, a new year, a new chapter, a new hope for a year that eventually won't have a pandemic. But we need to think about what is the new that we should long for? What is the new that God is calling us into? God is calling us into a new that is eternal, not one that is shiny, not one that will break, not one that can even be marred by sickness. The new that satiates our heart's longing, the new that is right and good, and the new that is ultimately of and from God. So this morning, we're going to look at John's vision, just a part of it in Revelation 21 and see and tease out what is this new that God invites us into. I invite you to turn with me to Revelation 21, 1 through 5, the word of the Lord. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. 
he who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. So when John received this revelation and wrote it down for the people of his time, what was the context in which they were hearing this, in which they were receiving it? We need to know this because as uh, Richard Bauckham, a, th a theologian who studied extensively the book of Revelation, he says, part of the strategy of Revelation was to redirect John's hearers' imaginative response to the world. That is, the point of Revelation is to seep into their imaginations, for them to understand the world in a new way. The reason for this was because John's hearers were bombarded by the images of Rome and the empire. It was on their money, their coins, their currency, the commerce of the day, all had images of the Caesar. The temples, and at that time, the temples were increasing in emperor worship, and they were all around and everybody went to them. The soldiers and armies, of course, of Rome were everywhere trying to keep the peace of Rome. And at this time, there was a bit of a legend or a story about the miracle of Rome. You see, Rome had almost fallen to ruin in 69 AD, which was at the end of Nero's rule. You know, and, and maybe hard for us to understand, but it would be like one of the superpowers now. If we thought the U.S. or China were suddenly to crumble, that's the type of fear that was around the potential crumble of Rome. But what had happened was two generals became emperor and they saved Rome. And it was seen and told as a miracle story. So much so that it was built up that this was an eternal empire with everlasting cities. So these were the stories. This was the imaginative world in which John hearers were living. Now think about the Christian context. They had just sustained one major wave of persecution. Nero, who had previously been emperor, had been horrible to the Christians. We know some of the historical stories of Nero even using Christians as torches for his parties. But now there was a second wave of persecution. And it was all centered on this emperor worship. These emperors were seen as the miracle workers. So why wouldn't they worship them? In fact, people were expected to have a document of sacrifice. And this document was a proof that people were worshiping the emperor. So you can imagine this was very difficult for Christians. This document of sacrifice was essential for the social and economic life in the empire. So these Christians that John was pastoring even from afar on the island of Patmos, they were being fed major propaganda about Rome. And so they were in desperate need of an alternative image of reality. They needed a picture of something new. They needed something new that would sustain their hope. Something new that would be more substantial, more glorious than even the miracle of Rome. Well, we too are in, well, we're in a very strange time in history. What with uh, the pandemic and wondering about the reality of 2021. Many things that we held as normal and stable got suddenly shifted last March and, and made us wonder about our reality and what is the story we're living in let alone just the story of consumerism and economic progress that we have, I think, are seeing now a little bit differently because of the pandemic. And, and all these messages that we still get, that, that we're supposed to be new, that we're supposed to be productive, that we're supposed to be young, that we should have a life of leisure. We too are being fed all kinds of stories from the empire and the culture in which we live. So how do we clear our heads of the propaganda of our time? How, how do we step into a different story and a different kingdom imagination? Just like those first century Christians, we need a robust and glorious picture of something new. Maybe even more so now as we end 2020. 
We need something new that will shape and sustain our hope. We need something new that is more glorious and substantial because of God and of his Christ. And if you listen to this passage that we just read, John's vision that he received, of course, from God is bursting with new. It's bursting with newness. The Greek word kainos is, means superior to what was, better than. That's the word that we translate to new. And what's interesting here is that this idea of kainos or newness is not a destruction of the old. It's rather a transformation of what was to something new, something superior, something better than. And that's the primary point of transit transformation. When God's presence um, infects a place, impacts someone or a reality, it takes what was and makes it into something better, something more than. God, we know, restores the whole relationship with all of creation. That's the vision we're getting here. Eugene Peterson says, this is not an ending, rather it's a fresh beginning. So all that is new in Revelation. Let's look at all of the new things that John sees and hears in this passage. First, we're introduced to a new heaven and a new earth. That's like, that's all encompassing. So the idea is like when I say, oh, you know, it's from A to Z. I mean the whole thing. So when we say from the new heaven and the new earth, it means everything and everything in between those things. So this newness is all encompassing. Furthermore, it would have hearkened back to the first heaven and the first earth, right? Which makes us think of Genesis. Again, Eugene Peterson says, the sin-ruined creation of Genesis is restored in the sacrifice-renewed creation of Revelation. So there's this continuity back to Genesis bringing us here in Revelation. So a new heaven and a new earth. There's also this new aspect. We're told there is no sea. Now, as most of you know, I live in Port Dover. And one of the things I love about living in Port Dover is the water, that we're right by the lake. And so I know for some people when they hear this passage and think, well, there's no sea, I'm not sure I want to be part of this new reality. But again, this is symbolic language. The sea is always changing, right? I know when we go boating on Lake Erie, Kelly's always very careful because the lake can change just like that. So this idea that there is no sea is trying to tell the hearers and us that this is a changeless reality, that it's steady, it's stable. And in a year of so much change, don't we just want steady and stable? Also in the Hebrew imagery, the sea and water was considered dangerous, untamable, destructive. That's why it was so powerful when the Israelites went through the Red Sea or then again went through the River of Jordan because these were symbols of destruction and of death and God bringing them through. So when John sees this vision of the new heavens and the new earth with no sea, it's saying there, that this is a safe place, this is a secure place, that this is a place of life versus death. Then we're also told about the new Jerusalem. I don't know, for some of you who are my age and older, it probably makes you think of that old hymn of the New Jerusalem, that majestic hymn, right? Well, this New Jerusalem, we're told, descends, comes down to earth, not vice versa, that, that the New Jerusalem comes to us. And this shows us that it's all God's initiative, that he brings the new to us. And I love the image we're given of a bride. Now, I've been uh, fortunate to do a lot of different weddings. And one of the most fun parts about a wedding, not only the bride, but I love it when, if the groom hasn't seen the bride, do you ever watch the groom? Like the bride comes in and you look down the aisle and typically the groom is either tearing up or the mouth is dropped because this is, he's, he's never seen her like this before. And that's the image we're getting here of the newness of the Jerusalem, an image of fresh and glowing love of a heart of something new that's beginning. And then we're told it's a new city which is interesting. 
versus a new garden. Because remember at the beginning of the story in Genesis, we find ourselves in a garden that God has recreated. But at the end of the story, well, really the new beginning of the story, we're in a new city. And that's intentional. We do not return to Eden. We do not return to a paradise garden. And the original hearers, John's people, would have been city people. So they would have been thrilled that this was the ideal city. This was not the cities that they were living in under the Roman Empire. These were new, renewed cities. And a city points to the cultural mandate back in Genesis. Remember, humanity was given the task of cultivating the potential of the earth to create culture, to create agriculture, to create institutions and education and even commerce. And so this idea that it's a city, a new city that comes, honors that cultural mandate. A city encompasses human culture and community. As one commentator puts it, the hope of the new Jerusalem includes the fulfillment of all human needs, including hunger, thirst, relationships, and relationship with God. What's another new thing that we discover in this passage? Well, there's a new people. And this new people is all, are all people. The plural is emphasized. That is, this is not just Israel, which shouldn't surprise us because back in Genesis 12, when Abraham is called out, his descendants are going to be, a, be, a ble to be blessed, to be a blessing to all people. That was always the intent that people from all nations would come and be part, be part of God's people, an ingathering of all the people groups. I mean, can you imagine that day? That's just going to be a blast. The type of music we'll get to sing, which right now we're all hankering to do, the type of food that we're going to be able to eat because of all the ethnicities gathered around. So a new people. And then we're told that there's a whole new reality that God is present, directly present, dwelling with his people, with his all-encompassing love. We're told there is no temple. You know why that is? Because everything is temple now. God doesn't need a specific dwelling place because he dwells with his people. And the whole of the new heavens and the new earth is God's palace temple. There is no death. Because the new man, Jesus Christ, who we just celebrated his birth at Christmas, has triumph. We're told that there's no more tears, that they're wiped away. What an intimate picture that God wipes away every tear. And that all of this new reality is undergirded, encompassed, enveloped in the love of God. What an amazing picture of this new reality. We're told that Christ is making all things new. Making all things new. It's a present continuous verb for those of you who like grammar, which means that this is an ongoing action of God. We're not just waiting for it. We're already part of it now. It was already started in the very birth of Jesus Christ. And then his life and his ministry and his death and his resurrection and his ascension. He is already in the process of making all things new. That's why we pray, your kingdom come here on earth as it is in heaven. Christ, we know, is the new man. Christ, according to Paul, is the second Adam who brings forgiveness and freedom. He is the risen Christ and he is the deposit and the hope of the resurrection to come. The new life in Christ, we know we're living right now in the now and the not yet. Kind of like we're living with the pandemic. We know there's a vaccine coming and it's slowly going to be coming out tiered, right? According to needs. So we know that this will, Lord willing, eventually come to the end. But right now we have just heard of a new lockdown uh, in the province and, and it feels like, is it really coming? But we're living between the now and the not yet. The Holy Spirit is the agency of this new life, of this new reality. We are the new creation of God through the power of the Holy Spirit. 
God, through his spirit, breathes his life in and through us so that the kingdom and character of Christ is being formed in us. That's the kind of new we should be seeking out and pursuing. And the church, the church, as much as the church sometimes can drive us a little crazy, the church is the new community of Christ. It's the beginning of God's outworking of his new creation. So friends, we're called to be ambassadors and signposts of his renewal, empowered to live transformed lives. And I know you are trying to be that as a church. I know right now it's been a little stymied because of the pandemic, but you've You've taken on a new name. You're trying to figure out how you can use this new building for purposes for the community. That's exactly the newness that you are called to live into as Cross Point Community Church. And the early church was a vibrant witness to the new. That's why people were so drawn to it. It was a new community, especially breaking down barriers, something that the Roman Empire had never seen. Men and women who were equal, slave and free, acting together, Jew and Gentile. People scratched their heads when they saw the early church. They couldn't understand it. And they saw it especially in their acts of love. In fact, the 4th century emperor Julian was fearful of an empire takeover by the Christians because they were so powerful in their love, winning so many people over. It was a new lifestyle, directed and infused by God's love. So what is the new God is making in and through us? Well, I want to invite you this morning to think about what on the personal level. What is God asking you to, to live into that's new for you? And maybe this pandemic and this year has really pushed those limits. What are the old and former ways of being that are obstacles for you to live into this kingdom reality? Be open to the Spirit's illumination and conviction. Because the Spirit, remember at creation, when it was all chaos and void and a mess, the Spirit hovered. And then life and light and order came to be. And so the Spirit hovers over us individually and communally, also wanting to bring life and light. And as a community, how is new life being birthed in you? How is God on the move in and through you? How is his love empowering and transforming you, even when church right now is looking different? We are called this morning to being recipients as well as agents of making all things new. So I want you to be encouraged, even as we don't know what 2021 is quite gonna bring, but be encouraged and be filled with the vision of God who is making all things new in and through us till he returns transforming us and all of creation by his stunning love and his all-encompassing presence. Friends, that is the confidence and the hope with which we step into 2021. And all God's people say, Amen. Let's take a moment now and pray, because I think we really need God to come in and give us this vision in this time. Oh, holy God, we thank you for this amazing vision that you gave to John and that you are now giving to us. You know that this has been an incredibly strange and hard year. And we are so feeling in that space of the now and the not yet, knowing that the vaccinations are coming, which seems like it will eventually open us up back to life as we knew it. But at the same time, we're not there yet. In fact, we're on a, on a month long lockdown here in Ontario. May, Lord, we live into that experience because that's the experience of your story. We are living in the now and the not yet. We know Jesus came. We celebrated his birth. We know that he is victorious, sitting on the throne. And so we have hope and confidence. But we also aren't there yet. And so we're still dealing with tears, tears of mourning and of grief and of death and of struggle. So, Lord, infuse our imaginations with this vision of Jesus Christ claiming that he is making all things new. Right now, even now, may your kingdom come here on earth as it is in heaven. 
We pray this all in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come, I come. Just as People of God, I invite you into this blessing as we step into this week and maybe even more importantly as we step into a new year. God invites us into his future where the one who makes all things new has made his home among us. We are called and chosen together embraced by the God in whom tears, mourning, crying, pain, and even death will be no more. Remember God's future, for this is our story. Our Lord says, see, I am coming soon. And we respond, come Lord Jesus, come. And all God's people say, amen.